Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are doing a book review, taking a look at Testing the War Weapons by Timothy J. Mullen. Now, we're specifically reviewing this book, but a lot of the critique I have of this one does apply to its two sister companions, one on handguns, one on submachine guns, machine pistols, and shotguns. These, all three of these books are kind of written the same way with the same in intent, and I think they all suffer really from the same, I hate to say flaws, but I think I will have the same critiques of all three. Now, this is intended to be, as the title kind of suggests, sort of a, a user's level perspective of combat infantry rifles, machine guns, and sniper rifles written by a guy who has very legit combat experience. Uh, Mullen was a U.S. Army officer, infantry officer, uh, served in Vietnam, served with the M14, uh, the early AR-15 or M16 carbines, as well as the M60. So he's been in combat, he knows what combat is, and the premise here is hopefully we can get this really interesting uh, perspective on combat application of vintage and not so vintage rifles. This covers things as far back as, uh, well, the black powder cartridge era. Uh, the 1870 Vetterly is in here, the Remington Rolling Block is in here, the Trapdoor Springfield is in here, and it goes pretty much up to the present day. Um, he ends this with the M16A2, uh, the FAMAS, the British SA80, um, the SIG 550, that, you know, the, the modern, what we would still pretty much consider modern rifles today. Now, there are a couple critiques I have of the book in general, and starting at kind of a fundamental level, I think it lacks editing. This is a very long book. It's almost 400 pages long. It is, in fact, more than 400 pages long. Sorry, 419 pages total, cover to cover. Um, and I think you could have gotten the same amount of information in about half the space, which would have a good editor could have made this book a lot more engaging and readable without losing any of the real content. One of the problems I have with it is, honestly, it's dry. I have a hard time reading through it. Um, it's much better suited to picking it up, flipping to one specific gun, reading those three or four pages or two pages, depending, and then putting it back on the shelf until next time. If you do that, you kind of miss... Yeah, you don't get caught up in how repetitive and dry a lot of the writing is. And a lot of that comes from the second critique I have, which is that of the 148 guns in here, there are an awful lot of repeats. Uh, there are no less than 24 different Mauser rifles in here, and in practical application, they're virtually all the same. You know, the difference between a Spanish M93 Mauser and a Spanish M95 Mauser and a Gewehr 98 and a Car 98K and even a U.S. 1903 Springfield, there's not that much difference. They're really, really similar rifles. In some cases, they're virtually identical rifles. But because the organization of this book is by nationality, those guns get covered over and over and over. And while this is most significant on the Mausers, it also occurs with a lot of the other types of guns. Um, there are about half a dozen most Nagants in here. There are six or eight Enfields. Um, even, even some of the modern stuff. For example, the Chilean PE-57 and the Swiss Sturmgewehr 57 both appear in here, which, when in fact those are frankly identical rifles, just one in a different caliber sold for a different army. Um, those, for example, you only need one of those chapters in the book. The other one could just as easily be dropped, um, or just combine the two. When it comes to the specific evaluation of the guns, I think, unfortunately, things are often left at a kind of formulaic and rather shallow level. There are, you get the feeling when you get about a third of the way into the book, you start to realize that this whole book could have kind of been a big checklist, um, you know, a, a big just table of here are the rifles and here are the criteria that we're going to evaluate and a, basically a yes, no, maybe. Um, for example, the sights. Are the sights good or are the sights poor? Most of the time, especially with the older guns, the sights are pretty poor. Now they're poor in different ways. Um, you know, the Trapdoor Springfield has a very narrow front sight, which is different than all of the different Mausers, which tend to have this European triangular front post and rear notch. Um, 
a, you'll you'll read over and over and over about the the zero on the rifles being set to something like you know two three four five hundred meters, which of course causes you to shoot very high at a hundred. That's a problem on a lot of guns, everything from the World War One era and most of the stuff from the World War Two era. But and that, that's one of the areas where an editor could have improved this is that gets repeated every single time it's applicable and and you get to the point where you're kind of skimming through these evaluations going, oh, okay, it's got, we can check the box for, for poor old style sights. We can check the box for the trigger is kind of long and gritty because so many of the military rifles are or were. Um, the accuracy testing is done. And a lot of the rifle evaluation, it seems to me, is done from the perspective of kind of old school US Army, which makes sense, with a focus on precision uh, target marksmanship and heavy downrange impact. So not a lot of consideration is given to the virtues of a, for example, 5.56 or 5.45 by 39, a light recoiling fast follow-up rapid fire carbine as opposed to a heavy quote unquote battle rifle. And there are a number of other elements that where, where I would really like to have seen more explanation or more depth um, Mullen has some opinions that he makes clear, like adjustable gas systems are better than non-adjustable ones, that cleaning rods are better than cleaning pull-throughs, and this is never explained. Um, his reasons for making those, con for coming to those conclusions are never laid out. So we're left with, well, I can accept his opinion or I can doubt it, but I don't have his reasons behind those opinions with which to come to my own opinion. Um, you know, am I in a different circumstance? Am I looking at things from a different perspective? And would that give me, would that lead me to the same conclusion as Mullen or different ones? We have no way of knowing because his, the reasons for his explanations are never made clear. I was happy to find that he actually agrees with me on a few points that I thought were kind of non-standard on my part. Um, most specifically the sights on uh, World War II Italian rifles, when they had ditched all the adjustability and went to just plain fixed sights, and also the World War I French rifles, where they went to this very wide front post. Um, I kind of like both of those, and I found not a whole lot of other people do, and Mullen did, which was, that was cool to see. Um, on the other hand, when we take a look at the PE-57 or Sturmgewehr 57, his thoughts on that rifle end up being completely the opposite of mine. So, Unfortunately, I'm not left with a whole lot of, of understanding of why those opinions would be so different. Um, I would have rather seen more, more background and more detail on a smaller number of rifles. And I think that's something where an editor could have been a big help. Unfortunately, I didn't find a whole lot in here that was um, surprising or that would be surprising or un unknown or novel to a lot of people. A lot of this seems to be a fairly surface level analysis, you know, yeah, World War II rifles tend to have sights that are zeroed too far out and triggers that aren't very good. And they're all going to kind of handle the same. It would have been nice to, to shorten up the sections on that and focus more on things like what was the combat application of the Remington rolling block? That's an area where very few people have experience and where we can look at it and go, you know, this was actually a frontline military rifle for a major part of the world, and how did that work, and how was it different from some of the other guns of the era? And he touches on that, but only lightly, and I wish there had been more of that material. Um, as I mentioned, this is a pre-internet book, so in many ways it would be interesting also to see a second edition of it published today uh, with the benefit of 15 or 20 years of online accessible information. Uh, for all of the the very legitimate criticism of the internet as being full of, you know, repeated nonsense and, and crap, it also has brought a ton of information and made it accessible to, in ways that were never um, available before and to people from and to people who were never able to communicate before. Today, it's not difficult at all to go online and find someone in a European military power who uses a particular gun on a daily basis and ask them what their opinion is of it. Um, something that wasn't really possible in the 1990s. So it would be interesting to see this rifle, this book, updated with the, the additional knowledge that I'm sure Mullen has today. And I think the lack of that really sets this book back 
in today, in 2017. So um, in addition, there are some technical issues that aren't great. Um, the photos in the book are all black and white, and there aren't a whole lot of them either. Um, some of the captions are, are uh, mistaken. You know, some of the captions are obviously swapped or the wrong pictures put in place of a specific caption. Um, there were a number of small technical details about the guns that were wrong, um, but I don't want to delve too much into that. That's not that big a deal. I think I've gotten across my, my major critiques of the book, and these do apply really to all three books uh, fairly equally. Um, but of course, the rifle one is the one where I have the most direct experience myself in order to hopefully um, give it a fair judgment. So if you are still interested in checking out this or either of the other two, uh, do take a look at the description text below. You'll find links there to all three of them on Amazon where you can pick them up if you're interested. Um, and uh, I think that pretty much covers it. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Tune in again to uh, the next video we have up on Forgotten Weapons. About